Hello everyone, I'm Ari Goldberg welcoming you to season five of Simply Science. And to kick off our first episode, we have some particularly interesting stories for you this month. Like how to turn your swimming pool into a swimming pond, how do fireflies work, and how we can capture solar energy with our clothes. But first, the classic imagery of high school science classes, dissecting worms, cutting up specimens. But when COVID-19 shut down lab work across the city, two Hunter College high school students decided to keep doing dissections on their own and film it. And it became a worldwide phenomenon called O-Worm. Don Hanover has that story. So here are the nostrils of the snake. Twins Jaya and Jay Kim love science, especially biology. When COVID closed their high school lab courses, they started doing dissections at home and filming them for other kids and teachers. So these aortic arches are basically modified versions of regular blood vessels that pump blood throughout the worm's body. The anatomy of a dogfish shark. Here are the gill slits, and on this side they're still intact, but in this side, I cut it open. Their YouTube channel and website called O oh Worm went viral. It literally started as one video we filmed at home. This was like just over a weekend. I think our first video was a worm dissection, which is where we got the name. Their work took off because so many older online visuals were grainy and static. They just weren't in like HD. They were like really old and like some of them were pretty inaccurate. So we thought that we could produce a better alternative for these. Their work has now been viewed over 600,000 times in more than 670 schools and colleges. An interactive map shows where their viewers are. And we just didn't think it would blow up that way. You have taken requests, right? We have taken requests, yeah. We did fetal pig because that is like a really big thing in the AP Bio curriculum. Chicken wing was also really dear to my heart because it was like especially one of my um, high school teachers like specifically asked me to do it for them because they were like planning on a lab. Jaya and Jay mostly order the specimens to dissect online and each dissection can take anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours. They're in college now, Jaya at Stanford and Jay at Rice, but they were recently back home in New York showing us how to dissect a garter snake. They actually have four rows of teeth on the roof of their mouth, so one, two, the normal, but then they also have two inner rows of teeth. One dissects, the other films, consulting as they go. Is it the gray one? That, that's what's literally covering it. They record audio along the way as a guide to what they plan to say in the final video. They have a transparent scale, a single one over each eye. Since they don't have eyelids, snakes can't blink. We both work on every dissection. Like whoever has more time, like more time at the moment, does like a lot of the research. We read like anatomy textbooks, like different specialized texts, watch other people's videos, and write like a script for di the dissection. They do all the dissections for O Worm themselves and write articles about them on the website. They also post info they've found and welcome people to submit articles. Their parents, who brought the family to New York from South Korea, are both dentists, so they value science. How did they react to the idea at first? They had like a little bit of mixed feelings in the beginning. So they were like, what do you mean you're going to be doing dissections at home? Like, is that even a thing? And can you even do that? And like, will anyone even watch the video? But I really appreciate that like they gave us a trial run. They had faith in us. Some videos have funny captions, like for a pig ovary, all your eggs in one basket, and for a bull testes, low hanging fruit. We have like a lot of quotes and like different like little jokes and puns in like as a subtitle. It's probably bad for a search algorithm because like we have all that other thing is not relevant to the video. So YouTube is probably like, what? Students love the videos because the Kims have a youthful approach. Jaya and Jay hope O Worm helps students in underfunded schools feel the excitement of science. We just wanted to create free like biology resources that everyone could access. They are happy to be a source for online learning because they got a boost, like from videos about how to use a scalpel. One question they get often, what's it like to work so closely with a sibling? 
So Jay and I, we make, I think we make a really good team because I don't think I could have done this alone, especially just like with the mental part of it. It just seems like such a big thing to take on on your own. And Jay knows more about um, a lot of these animals than I do. First of all, she's like intimidatingly smart. <laughs> so we have that going, but like we, we are competitive, but in like a really healthy way. It's kind of weird to say, but she is, she's a pretty good twin to both like work with and just like as a twin too. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. Every surface in the world could capture solar energy, from the hat on your head to the roof of your car to the pants you're wearing. Even our own reporter, Barry Mitchell, he could light up a room. When we think solar energy, we think of those big glass panels on top of the roof. Well, meet the new generation of solar panels. I'm actually wearing them right now. We manufacture solar-powered fabric products, so really, Anything that gets hit by the sun is an opportunity to generate electricity. I tried on the blue jacket, but here at Pavilion in Brooklyn, they're all about creating green energy. In fact, they spell Pavilion without an A. A sly acknowledgement, PV stands for photovoltaic, the science that causes solar cells to turn sunlight into storable electricity. Building materials get lighter and lighter and lighter. Right now, this is the lightest. This is our basic building block. It's a structural fabric integrated with flexible solar panels. Well, this, this is very thin, but it's actually seven layers, seven lamination. Most of what we do is we actually laminate solar cells in fabric. We made eight solar powered canopies at the New York Botanical Gardens that provide lighting at night, shade and shelter during the day as a picnic area for people to sit under. And then you can charge your cell phone, you can plug in your laptop, and then excess power actually ties back into the grid as needed. One of the biggest power demands right now is charging cell phones. Let me charge you. We've worked with some various consumer brands, including Tommy Hilfiger, to generate electricity using clothing and bags and backpacks. So you have your solar, you have your battery, and you have your cell phone that you want to charge. That's a grid right there. You've created it. That's a micro micro grid. It's a nano grid. Let me fix this. So Colin, what are your people working on now? Right now, they are building military products that are going to be deployed for remote and expeditionary applications. We have a kit right now that's in Poland working with Ukrainian refugees and powering their classroom to teach English in Poland for Ukrainian refugees, which is a pretty special connection to what's going on in the tragedy in Ukraine. Transporting heavy generators and fuel is a costly, cumbersome chore for the military. The U.S. Air Force is among Pavilion's best customers. Assemble tent, fire up the inverter, it's included in the kit and converts the solar cell's DC electricity to usable AC power, and then let the sun go to work for you. Well, think about it. If you're a doctor and your role is to help patients, if you have to have the technological expertise to be fixing a generator and making sure your lights stay on, that's just a pain in the butt. So really what this is doing is it's allowing the experts to do what they do best and having the power not be something to think about. Right now it's tents and canopies and awnings and you know it's a little more bulky, it's a little more rigid, but at some point you know it's going to be like the linen of my shirt. The goal is that every piece of fabric is solarized and you wouldn't even know that your shirt is solar powered and that's where we're going to head in 10 to 20 years. I wonder what Benjamin Franklin would say about green energy. We've come a long way since he first flew his kite to prove there's electricity in lightning. I think if Ben Franklin were alive today, he'd be shocked at how far we've come and he'd also be shocked at how far we haven't come. You know, there were electric cars in the 1910s, 1920s and we're 100 years later, we're launching the electric car. The technology has advanced, but at the same time, we we're really slow to adopt some of these things. And the irony is, this interview took place under the scornful stare of a traditional electricity substation. Your factory is right across the street 
from an old-fashioned power grid. What do you have to say about that? I hope to put them out of business one day. Barry Mitchell for Simply Science. You don't have to be a kid to appreciate a sense of wonder when gazing at fireflies. And there's all the more to appreciate when you understand how the glow of fireflies actually works. Fireflies are one of the great hallmarks of summertime, that evening magic as synonymous with the season as barbecues and sprinklers. But what's making this magic? How do fireflies actually light up? The answer lies in a very cool process known as bioluminescence. But before we get to that, let's talk about the firefly in general. First things first, fireflies aren't flies at all. They're a type of beetle. But sure, when naming insects, certainly firefly rolls off the tongue better than something like blazing beetle. And when you're seeing them out at night, you might be seeing several species at once because there are more than 2,000 species of fireflies worldwide. Some species will synchronize their flashing with each other. And in some species, adults don't flash at all. Some are predators, some eat pollen, and some don't eat. Once they're an adult, their only goal is just to procreate quickly before they die. And for the most part, procreating is what the flashing is all about. Like a peacock's feathers or a frog's oh-so-seductive rivet, the main purpose of glowing is trying to attract a mate. While it seems rare on land, this bioluminescence is actually a very common phenomenon in the animal kingdom. It's just that the vast majority of it is going on in the ocean, and often at depths we can't see anyway. Many species of fish, shrimps, squids, jellyfish, plankton display bioluminescence. In fact, some studies have shown that three quarters of all animal life in the ocean have this ability to create light. So let's talk about creating light. Making light is all about releasing energy. And oftentimes, when energy is released, it's released in the form of light and heat. A campfire, light bulb, sunshine, all create light, but they can also produce a lot of heat with it. So if animals want to create light, they can't exactly go about starting fires inside themselves and expect to, you know, live. And that's the problem bioluminescence solves. Bioluminescence is a chemical reaction, not unlike glow sticks, where instead of a lot of energy also being released as dangerous heat, the vast majority of energy is released only as light. As such, it's known as a cold light. The exact mechanism for creating it is not always entirely understood, as the process is somewhat different one species to another. But for most bioluminescent animals, the basic process requires three things. A light-producing compound called luciferin, oxygen to react with it to produce light, and an enzyme to help facilitate that reaction called luciferase. Now, luciferin and luciferase are generic terms for these types of chemicals. Firefly luciferase is different from jellyfish luciferase. And some of these species need a few more ingredients for their chemical reactions, like magnesium or calcium, but the general action is similar. With the help of luciferase, oxygen combines with luciferin to create, appropriately, oxyluciferin, a compound in a very excited, high energy state. Now, remember how we said making light is all about releasing energy? Well, when oxyluciferin comes down from that high, back down to a ground state, it releases that energy as it does, in the form of light. Fireflies turn on and off their light by regulating how much oxygen they let in or not. Actually, nitric oxide plays a major role in that regulation in fireflies. That's the same gas produced by Viagra in humans. I guess for fireflies, it really is all about procreation. And while attracting a mate is indeed the main goal for fireflies, bioluminescence is used for different things by different animals in the ocean. Attracting prey, communicating, distracting predators, camouflage, all of them specifically adapted to their own environment. But for our environment here on land, all that science aside, it sure makes for a pretty light show on a summer evening in the park. 
We are back with dietitian Stacia Helfand on why sleep and nutrition are so intertwined. You could be doing everything right in terms of your food and your nutrition. If your sleep is terrible, you're not going to reach your goals nearly as efficiently or as well as you would if you prioritize your sleep. Research on sleep is so conclusive. People who sleep more weigh less. People who sleep more and better have better mental health, better immune systems, better resilience, better cellular repair. I mean, there's really nothing that's not better with quality sleep. The habits that you have before you go to bed are called sleep hygiene. So it could be that it's 10 o'clock, you're gonna turn off all screens, and then you're going to wash your face and brush your teeth and use your moisturizer. Maybe a little essential oils if I'm really pushing it. Maybe you read your novels. Let's turn out the light, it's 10.30. If you do the same thing every single day, then your body really figures out how to set itself up to sleep well. Go to the National Sleep Foundation. They've got great tips about keeping your temperature appropriate, your clothing, your room environment set up for successful sleep. Maybe you need an eye mask because the light comes in early. Maybe the noise pollution is really strong. But figuring out how to maximize and prioritize your sleep is going to help you meet your nutrition and wellness goals that much faster. Why would anyone want to turn their pool into a pond? Andrew Falzone has the answers. Rob and Pat McCabe put a small pond in the front of their Howard Beach home about a decade ago. They enjoyed it so much that when a much larger body of water in their backyard wasn't getting much use, they decided to make a major change. Now we had a pool in the backyard at, at the time. Didn't really use it that much. So we figured, let's do a pond. But converting 10,000 gallons of chlorinated swimming pool into a fish-friendly pond isn't easy. Rob reached out to Jeff Augie of Island Aquascapes, who's been building large water features like Rob's dream pond for 23 years. But in talking to Jeff, it sounded a lot more like a science project. It's going to have plants, fish. It's going to be something that is, runs all year round. So there's going to be waterfalls that flow in the winter. Uh, it doesn't have to get closed down like the traditional swimming pool. Everything is contained in the, in the system. But building that system would take over three weeks of hard work and heavy machinery. On the northern end of the pond, the plastic latticework that would form the bog filter was put in place. Along the eastern wall of the pond, a series of waterfalls began to take shape. And where metal pool steps once guided visitors into the water, over a ton of bluestone was meticulously placed for a more natural set of steps, as this isn't going to be any old pond. They call it a plunge pond. That means you could swim with fish in there. And eventually Rob says he'll get large koi fish like these for his pond, but wants the water to stabilize first. You could probably tell that koi and goldfish are related, both members of the carp family. What you might not know is that unlike their indoor tank dwelling cousins, koi fish aren't fed during the winter. That's when they enter a state known as torpor or dormancy. It's similar to hibernation in mammals, but technically different in part because of how it's triggered. Once the temperature goes below uh, 60 degrees, stop feeding the fish because their metabolism will uh, basically shut down and um, they'll go into a winter mode uh, with, where if they eat, the, fish can be, the food can actually become toxic in their system. And the year-round flowing waterfalls will keep the water oxygenated for the fish. And though no fish will call the pond home until next summer, there's already a special dwelling for them, an underwater cave with a very important purpose to keep out some potentially unwanted, deadly neighbors living in the estuaries of nearby Jamaica Bay. Birds prey on fish, and the fish are instinctively know when there's danger, and they go right into the cave. Um, there are times where the, if, if the fish sense a bird or, or some type of uh, predator, they'll stay in the cave for days. So the plants are adding oxygen to the water. They're using the nutrients and they provide a beautiful aesthetic value uh, to the pond, something beautiful to look at. 
and it was apparent that the all-natural filtration was doing its job when Rob invited me to be the first person to take a plunge in the pond, you could see straight through from one side to the other. Helping out the skimmer and the plants is the pond's main filter. It's called a bog filter because it works very similar to a bog in nature. Healthy bacteria in the water devour microscopic nutrients, so there's nothing for algae to eat because algae would turn the pond green. So underneath us is four feet of a biological filter or what we call a bog filter. The water enters at four feet down it slowly rises up through those black boxes and spreads out. The idea is for the water to slow down and spread out and slowly rise up to the gravel. And as the water rises up to the gravel slowly, the biological colonies that are becoming established in, in this filter, along with the roots of the plants, all take out the nutrients from the pond. So as the bacteria begin to nestle into their underwater home and Rob looks forward to adding his koi next summer, it's amazing to think that most of the pond is maintained not through hard human work, but good old science. This is a combination of mechanical filtration, biological filtration, aeration, plants, fish, rocks, gravel. Uh, everything come to, came, comes together to keep this body of water as clear as we see it at all times. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science. When people are looking to get a dog, a lot of times they're thinking about breed. The thought being that's a good predictor of a dog's personality. But it turns out that might not be true. Mike Gilliam explores whether a dog's breed is a good indicator if that puppy's going to be a good fit or not. <laughs> Dobermans are aggressive and dangerous, but Labradors are safe around children. Common beliefs among people for years, but a new study says a dog's breed may not actually determine if it has the personality you're looking for. Sarah Biosir is the director of the Hunter College Thinking Dog Center. Recently, new studies have found that breed can be helpful in figuring out what certain traits you might be wanting to look for in your next dog. That being said, the variation within a breed is often quite extensive. She says you might be looking for a swimming buddy, but the lab you find won't like to swim, while a Doberman might love the water. It really depends on the dog. A dog's breed is not predictive of their personality, and, and we know that. We, we see this regularly. You can have a border collie that is rather lazy, which counters all of the biases that we generally usually assume would go with a border collie. That being said, if you want a dog that's going to go out and herd sheep, it may make sense to look at border collies in general as a breed, as a population, because you are more likely to find a herding individual within that breed. Lisa Rothkoff has an English bulldog named Ellie, and she's seen the variations firsthand. I grew up with pugs. I've had pugs are typically supposed to be very friendly, and like clown dogs, I've had pugs that were super friendly, and then I've had some who are totally not. She believes a dog's personality has more to do with environment. But has a lot more to do with just the early formative um, few weeks of socialization and mother care and stuff like that. It plays a big role. So I believe recent numbers suggest that um, in general there are certain behavioral traits that are about 25% heritable, meaning that you are you know, essentially getting a certain portion of this behavior or a likelihood of this behavior to occur from genetics. But that leaves a whole other 75% essentially for the environment and other extraneous factors to play into this. One very real problem that dog owners face comes when insurance companies and others don't want to deal with certain breeds because they feel they're aggressive. The experts say that's unnecessary and wrong. I understand why the policies are in place at a surface level, but I don't think the policies can exist um, as a blanket policy for all individuals because you can have a Labrador that behaves the same way um, and is absolutely as aggressive as someone might say a pit bull could be. Some dog owners have complained that they can't get homeowner's insurance because of their dog's breed. So is that practice prevalent? 
Yes, um, in terms of insurance, yes, in terms of acquiring housing, even more so. Uh, we also have in certain states and in certain um, areas across the, the US, we have breed specific legislation, which essentially states that certain breeds are not welcome, are not allowed. Lisa says that carries over to landlords and homeowners associations. My building does have breed restrictions. No Rottweilers, Dobermans, pit bulls. She says she also had a problem with someone on a condo board trying to keep her out because she thought Ellie looked like a mean dog. It was eventually worked out. So how do you find that pooch with the perfect personality? Make friends with individuals in the dog community. Talk to dog owners when you are at the dog park. Potentially go without a dog, sit there. Try to get to know people and meet different breeds. Look at the dogs that you see around you. See how they're behaving. Ask the owners, you know, how calm are they in the home? Is this dog good with kids? And have patience. It can take a while. I think right now, Getting a dog from a breeder takes about a year, if not longer. So be prepared to wait for your perfect pet. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. And that wraps up our show. Until next month, keep up with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. I'm Ari Goldberg. See you next time.